Hare Krishna, Krishna Maharaj. Thank you for joining once again. Hare so, Krishna, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. As is, ever, it's my yeah. pleasure to be with you. It's been a very devotionally enriching series of reflections on the Dashavataras. And today we come to the last. Of course, whether this will be the last of the series or we go on to discuss something about Krishna, we can decide later. But it's been a wonderful journey. I mean, I've had many podcasts, but this is the longest series we have had. So I'm grateful for your, your making yourself available and sharing your wisdom for so long, for, for so many months. It's been a nice opportunity for me uh, to, to think about, to reflect, to remember Krishna in this way, uh, in all the avatars. So it's all been for my benefit. <laughs> That's your kindness, Maj. So uh, shall we, I thought you usually started with uh, the prayer to the avatar. Would you like to do that? That's how we start. Okay. Off. Yes, we have <clears throat> from Sri Dash Avatar Stotra yes, of Srila Jai Dev Goswami. Uh, this is verse number 10. Mlecha Nivaha Nidane. Kalayasi Karavalam Duma Ketam Iva Kim Api Karalam Keshavadrita Kalki Sharira Jaya Jagadisha Hare. And the translation I have here O Keshavam, O Lord of the Universe, O Lord Hari who have assumed the form of Kalki. All glories to you. You appear like a comet, Dumaketum, and carry a terrifying sword, Karavalam, for bringing about the annihilation of the wicked barbarian men at the end of the Kali Yuga. Yes, Maharaj. Yes. So, one of the thoughts I had when we look at these verses, at one level, almost all the avatars, there is some amount of disruption and destruction. There's some disruption of the cosmic mm. order that is there. And then to correct that disruption, some amount of destruction is involved. So it's a, uh, in one sense, uh, what <clears throat> here, but here it's more of, uh, whereas there are specific people who are destroyed, like Ravan or uh, Hiranyakashipu, or in the case of Parashuram, the Kshatriyas, here it seems to be the largest number of people. It's not like one villain is there, or it's not even one category of human beings who's a villain. Of course, you can say that Nilet Chanivaha yeah. is one category, but that's like a much bigger category than say the Kshatriyas who were Jalalabhavan was described, that Kshatriyas who were um, who were become power, who were become abusive. Well, um, yes, and at the same time, I just looked in Canto 12. Uh, this is chapter 2 verses. It's several verses. It's um, verses 12 through 16. Maybe I just read the whole translation. By the time the age of Kali ends, the bodies of all creatures will be greatly reduced in size and the religious principles of followers of Varnashrama will be ruined. 
the path of the Vedas will be completely forgotten in human society and so-called religion will be mostly atheistic. The kings will mostly be thieves. The occupations of men will be stealing, lying, and needless violence. And all the social classes will be reduced to the lowest level of shudras. Cows will be like goats. Spiritual hermitages will be no different from mundane houses. And family ties will extend no further than the immediate bonds of marriage. Most plants and herbs will be tiny. And all trees will appear like dwarf shami trees. Clouds will be full of lightning. Homes will be devoid of piety. And all human beings will have become like asses. At that time, the Supreme Personality of Godhead will appear on the earth, acting with the power of pure spiritual goodness. He will rescue eternal religion. Um, and then... Maybe it was in the other book, in the... Uh, Lagu Bhagavatamrita, it's kind of specific about who is killed. Okay, uh, well, I'm just reading still Bhagavatam, verse 18. Kalki, Lord Kalki, will appear in the home of the most eminent Brahmana of Shambhala village, the great soul Vishnu Yasha. Okay, here it is, verse 20. Lord Kalki, the Lord of the universe, will mount his swift horse, Devadatta, and sword in hand, travel over the earth, exhibiting his eight mystic opulences and eight special qualities of Godhead, displaying his unequaled effulgence and riding with great speed. He will kill by the millions those thieves who have dared dress as kings. Okay. So it's not pure genocide. Okay. It's interesting that, <laughs> that there is the millions of kings or millions will impersonate as kings. So <laughs> yeah. it's a it's quite a large number. Yeah, Kotisha. Mm. Dasyum. Yeah, okay. And Ripa Linga, they are dressed like kings. Mm. It seems in the scriptures the word king is often used in a somewhat inclusive sense. Oh, yeah. For example, Jarasandha, he seems to have imprisoned thousands of kings. Yes. Uh, so, so. It could be that there could be like small units, small areas, and their heads could also be called as kings. Yes. Like Nanda Maharaj is called also, he's not technically a king, but he's also called as a king. Still, so that's quite specific. So in a sense, it's like Parshuram. Parshuram was also killing the... He was kids. killing Kshatriyas, yeah. Yeah. It seems like Kshatriyas are the ones who are the big troublemakers. Because also in Dvaraka, at the end of Krishna, Krishna's pastimes, hmm. what does he do? He arranges for this grand uh, self-destruction of uh, the Kshatriyas of, uh, of Dvaraka. Because he anticipates, unless they, uh, unless they are removed from the earth, they are going to cause trouble. So better, <laughs> he's, he's doing some proactive. proactive. Uh, what's the other word they use in warfare now? Preemptive. Preemptive, preemptive he's, yeah. <laughs> he's doing some, some preemptive uh, strike <laughs> uh, to, to minimize the damage of his own departure because 
he's come to reestablish religious principles. He doesn't want those religious principles to get destroyed immediately by his own people. <laughs> mm. so, it also indicates you know, how vulnerable human existence is to, to evil or to vice. That as yeah. soon as the Lord departs or even among his own associates, that tendency towards uh, abuse of power and uh, vice can come in. Yes, especially in this age. Yeah, that's true. It seems to be the case. Yeah, so Kalki is um, finishing up. And as I understand, he's also beginning uh, the yes. next age. He's um, commencing the Satya or Krita Yuga. Mm. And so he's... Um, which is interesting because we understand that in Satya Yuga, there are no, there are no need of kings anymore. Isn't it? Because everyone... Yeah, everybody is almost like a Brahmanical a Paramahamsa. disposition. Paramahamsa. Oh, yeah, Paramahamsa, yeah. <laughs> so they don't need anyone to control them. Now we live in an age where there is ever increasing need of control and yet uh, and humans become more and more out of control uh, to the point, well, this of course uh, brings in one of the, f f brings in the form of government that we've seen a lot of in the last century, namely totalitarianism. Mm. Uh, that uh, people feel that there is danger everywhere, and so they accept uh, an, a totalitarian ruler in order to uh, at least get some modicum of peace, so supposedly or hopefully to get some peace. But of course, what happens is the totalitarian rulers make war against other totalitarian rulers, and then everyone suffers. Hmm. You know, recently, Maharaj, I've been thinking about this, that, you know, it's uh, like, say, monarchy, one of the reasons, oppositions to it is that because it can uh, because it can easily become a totalitarian form of government and mm -hmm. then the dem democracy is uh, what is thought of as a solution and in today's world we could say it is a reasonable solution but uh, ultimately uh, even within democracy there is no system to prevent totalitarian mentality coming upon uh, coming upon in some individuals and unless that inside out that inner changes at least there is a training and facility for that any form of government can be subverted to be made into totalitarian yes therefore there is need for brahmins yes <laughs> and a culture a brahminical culture and uh, and this is so much so much lacking so much um there's not even an idea, you can say, of Brahminical culture. The, close, the closest we have in modern society to Brahminical culture is the, you can say, the academic world. But of course, the academic world tends to be governed largely by uh, Rajaguna, in which everyone is striving to maintain their positions and advance their positions. Um, the, the whole world of science is also the same. So a real sattvic, uh, Brahmanical or Brahminical culture, we hardly see it. Mm. 
And therefore also people are disturbed because there's no direction, there's no sense of purpose. That's true. So in principle, how would uh, the presence of Brahmanas actually change the way a government is administered? I mean, I, I, we understand in principle that the Brahmanas should, the Kshatriyas should subordinate themselves to the Brahmanas. But uh, how do you think that will happen? Is it simply by the wisdom that, that those who are administrators or rulers will be impressed? Because in general, decisions in the world are taken, uh, decisions in terms of managing the world are not really taken always by, on the grounds of principles or even of wisdom. It's more on the grounds of what will work in the interests mm -hmm. of the... Expediency. Say, expediency, yeah. Not experience, but expediency. <laughs> yeah, expediency, yeah, that's right. Expediency, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, what do we read in Bhagavatam? We, we see there are sages, and the sages are respected by the kings, but they're also respected by, uh, by people in general. And this would be also an impetus for, for kings, for leaders, to listen to the sages. Um, we have some of that, of course. We, we have, um, what are they called? Influencers. We have intellect, public intellectuals who may be uh, listened to. Uh, the, the problem is, well, it, it comes back to a large extent to the way, the way democracy is set up. Um, I think there can be higher, there can be better and poorer forms of democracy. Um, there's what's called participatory democracy, uh, which is not what we have generally today. Participatory democracy, as the word suggests, it involves people actually spending time uh, sharing in the, um, the deliberations in, on a small scale. Um, and maybe this gets back to what I think uh, Mahatma Gandhi was talking about. He was uh, hoping for, it was kind of hope against hope, that India would return to um, government which would have its center in the villages. So the village Panchayat would be the place where uh, decisions were essentially made. I mean, he also recognized, he also accepted uh, what he saw as need for some sort of national government and so on. But um, the idea of participatory democracy, at least in theory, uh, is, is, I think, much more conducive to what Srila Prabhupada called Brahminical culture, in which you would have you would have in the assembly of people, you would have the wise, uh, cultured, uh, austere, especially this would be very important, that the Brahmins are austere, they are renounced, and therefore they're respected, they're listened to. Um, and then on that level, we could see a real engagement uh, of Brahminical wisdom. Interesting. You know, so what we have today is exactly not like representative democracy or something like that. It's a Republican democracy. So are you mm -hmm. talking about participatory democracy more in terms of, say, a more a distributed form of government where there is a decentralized form of government where, where a significant number of decisions are taken by the local 
local administrators and therefore people can be more involved at that level? Local administrators, but yeah, the, just the citizens themselves would be more, more concerned and involved in, uh, in decision, excuse me, decision making. Of course, we have local governments and so on, and people do, to some extent, some people get involved. Um, but uh, the, the extent of involvement, the numbers of people involved and so on. In a way, I think it comes back to, again, Srila Prabhupada's idea of uh, Varnashram College. <laughs> mm. Where people would be educated to, yeah, to be citizens, um, and and being the best that they can be, according to their potentials, their qualities, and their abilities, um, and therefore being happily engaged, and then on that basis, uh, government becomes meaningful and it becomes liberating. So we don't have much of an idea of these things now because uh, as we see in Shastra, things, <laughs> things are not evolving, they are devolving or so it seems. There's been a lot of um, ideas of of progress uh, over, over the years, over the centuries, and especially it's interesting to see uh, in the latter half of the 19th century in the West, especially the idea of progress uh, became a, a big um, buzzword, we say. Mm. It became a buzzword because uh, things looked so hopeful because of the Industrial Revolution, because of um, the development of technology, which seemed to be expanding in ways unheard of prior to this. Uh, you know, it started with they say it starts with started with the steam engine and so on. And so a lot of hope was there that we're going to now create, life is going to become easier uh, because of mechanical uh, conveniences. What they weren't considering was that people's moral substance does not thereby improve. Hmm. And what they were also not considering is that to make all of these machines work uh, requires energy, and that energy is coming from fossil fuels and one thing is leading to another and we as we all know today we are uh, pretty much destroying the entire environment and uh, changing the climate so that uh, the likes of the storm that you just told me before we uh, started recording in Maharashtra mm -hmm. are, are taking place. So none of that was uh, considered. Mm -hmm. But the Brahmanical or Brahminical culture would be able to say, um, wait, let's stop and think about this. How, how is this innovation going to help us. And it's interesting, this is maybe a footnote. I was just reading about this, uh, an article about the Amish. You know, the Amish uh, are these, uh, it's a Christians Christian Christians who group. live in a very reclusive kind of way. They adopt very yes. different technology and 
they stick a lot yeah. to their own rituals in fact many devotees sometimes take the example of amish or how we can establish varan ashram or i visited oh okay i visited one amish family uh about year and a half ago together with uh, a few devotees uh living near this family lives near um gita nagari in pennsylvania that's where most of the amish yeah. live in pennsylvania and uh, yeah about uh 10 of us uh krishna devotees uh came it was all arranged in advance they knew us from before very nice people and uh, very happy to answer our questions for about 2 hours um and a lot of things are interesting but the immediate point i wanted to make is that among the amish they have a tradition that it's not that they reject um technology as such but when a new form of technology appears they consider it very very carefully whether this is going to help or if it's going to hinder them and this consideration as i understand can take years <laughs> and they have their elders also mm. they have they have some uh organizational structure and uh, they they consider everything just very carefully and they may adopt something or they may adopt it with certain restrictions so it's common to hear of the Amish having a telephone but the telephone will be in a little booth that they will put uh at the out at the end of their driveway you know and they'll usually have a long a long driveway to, to their house and uh they will use public transportation uh they simp- they won't drive a car themselves but they will hire a taxi if need be uh they told us for example uh that soon they would be traveling to upstate new york for a wedding um and how would they get there well uh, they would be taking uh, taxis and trains and so on that was uh allowed just they won't have their own car they will they have their horses horses and buggies and this um uh, also then the horse and buggy culture they have determines the size of their communities they don't have any churches they always meet in each other's houses and this means that uh they the, they change houses one to another each i don't know each week uh and for someone to be a member of a particular community as opposed to another amish community um uh, they have to be able to come to the opposite the fu- the furthest most house in that community by horse within 2 hours hmm <laughs> so so that has the effect of uh controlling uh the size of their communities but here's another amazing point i found uh this particular family uh had i don't know if it was a year before sometime prior they had had a fire uh in their chimney uh which uh burned their roof pretty much destroyed the roof of their house okay within 24 hours they had a new roof on their house and how did that happen 
all their neighbors came together and the local lumber store, that, which is not Amish, but re which respects the Amish, they donated the lumber. And then all the, all the neighbors came around and helped replace the roof. So they had a new roof. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you are and, giving this as, a, as, as an example of how even in today's world, to some extent, a community can be self-sufficient if it is yeah. communitarian, it comes together. Yeah, yeah they don't so. depend, for example, on a fire insurance company, which anyway would take, um, you know, weeks, if not months to provide them replacement of the money with which then they could replace their roof. <laughs> That's... So it's in one sense, I think Prabhupada's emphasis was on simple living and to some extent, modern life in its attempt to become say more organized and easier, it has also become more complicated. Oh yeah. So it's become, you know, earlier you were mentioning this point of technological progress and it's, you mentioned two fallouts which are not considered. One was ecological and the other was moral. So I was also thinking another of, is of psychological. That hmm. the more complexity it is, the mind mind becomes more and more anxious. So oh, yes. Anxious and then depressed. And isn't it the World Health Organization counts depression as, if not the biggest uh, emotional problem today, one of the biggest? That's true. I think, in fact, they say that Anxiety and depression are two of the two of the biggest. Mm. Yeah. Uh, two of the biggest problems. Yeah. And so, then out of that anxiety and depression, uh, there is fear. Of course, uh, fear is at the very root of our material existence, as mm. mentioned in Bhagavatam, eleventh canto, Bayad Vitiya Bhinivesha uh, it start. It all starts with turning away from the Lord, and ends uh, in fear. But that fear seems to be multiplied uh, in modern life, as we become more fragmented. In this verse that we just read, it mentions the family. The extent of the family is the immediate family, uh, the so-called mm -hmm. nuclear family which means isolation, and isolation breeds fear. And That's all of this is fed also, it seems to be very much the case, to be fed by globalization, even though globalization and the hope was that it would bring us all more together. Um, we have to ask whether to what extent and where that's working. Hmm. That's okay. So the thing is, issue is here that uh, if we look at specific, uh, like the overall principles, I'm just thinking about these three things that the ecological fallout of technological progress, that is, that is more or less undeniable now that it has serious negative unforeseen consequences. Now, the correlation between technological progress and psychological distress or technological progress and, uh, and say, moral regress, if you want to say, are those also equally causally connected? Because one of the, why I'm bringing this point is that uh, whereas the, there is this radical difference between the way time is seen Way the uh, way things are moving as seen in the modern times, where we are saying that there is an arc of progress, that things are improving, and we are better than our ancestors, or we are better off than our ancestors, whichever way. That is the vision. <laughs> and while <laughs> while in Kaliuga, we understand that ultimately time goes cyclic. So in that sense, yeah. it's not an arc in going any direction, but at least in Kaliuga, it's going downward. So. Could it be that the, from external perspective, the technological progress is, is, is undeniable and it is also dazzling? 
So for example, right now we're just having this talk because of technological progress, this podcast. So, but could it be that this technological progress is also like a part of the Kali Yuga's illusion to make us blind to the decline that is happening or to make most of us at least that the things we, we think we are progressing, but actually in the areas that matter substantially, things are going down and we overlook that because of because of the because of the dazzle of or the dazzle or the promise of progress yes the uh, the play of maya <laughs> manda sumanda matayo manda bhagya hi upadruta right mm. in this age uh, Prabhupada's translation, of course, the word manda can just mean slow or bad, but Prabhupada translates quarrelsome, quarrelsome, lazy, misguided, <laughs> and always disturbed. So the, uh, the advance of technology um, could be feeding those qualities could be or or loss of qualities it could it could be um accelerating them yeah on the other hand it's it is hard to say you know if someone walks in and takes away our computers we will probably protest <laughs> We won't say, oh, thank you, Prabhu, you're blessing me. I, I'll be able to recover uh, my, my deeper qualities. We'll say, no, 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 give me back my computer. Because yeah. <laughs> we become very, we, we actually, they actually become extensions of our senses. That's beautiful, but extensions of our senses. So if we consider our senses as tools for getting things done or doing things, yeah. then our devices become extensions of those tools. I remember I was visiting, uh, I, I was traveling with one, one of our senior sannyasis, and we came to a particular place and the hosts were asking, Maharaj, what all do you need? Said, I'm a simple sannyasi. You don't have to arrange anything for me except prasad and Wi-Fi. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that's how it is. <laughs> Just give me Prasad and Wi-Fi. <laughs> what? No Wi-Fi? No, I can't stay here. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, in one but as for causality, I mean, one can you know try to analyze. Um, of course, it's easy for us to say, on the other hand, maybe we should be a little more cautious. Uh, we, we like to shake our heads and say, Kali Yuga is advancing. Um, but we can also look at good qualities of good people. We can look at intelligence of intelligent people. There are so many uh, intelligent, uh, wise people, thoughtful people, creative people, they're there. Um, I guess for me, the question is why those good, intelligent, virtuous, qualified, creative people are not, are not um, effectively bringing up the rest of society. Hmm. Or put it another way, here's another, I, I, you know, true confession, sometimes I'm looking at some video on YouTube, uh, generally, you know, devotional, <laughs> but sometimes some informational thing or whatever. Sometimes, um, I listen to Baroque lute music, for example. I find it very soothing and enriching. And um, it's like uh, it's been said, this is our Western Shanai music. And Prabhupada approved of Shanai music. So, and there you'll see 
with YouTube, you know, there's two buttons. Um, one is, you know, with thumbs up and the other is thumbs down, like and not like. Hmm. And I'm always amazed that anyone would push the 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 not like button for 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 these things it's like what's wrong with those people <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> here's something just you know utterly um uh, i mean it's it's at least sattva you know sattva guna it's uplifting you know it's nice it's uh if more, I think if more people would listen to, you know, Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach, if more people would listen to, um, you know, classical uh, Indian raga, I think we'd have a better world. <laughs> but then you'll find people who press the, you know, the no button. I don't like it. <laughs> What's wrong with them? <laughs> It's true. It's a significant question. And I think you know, Prabhupada in the 14th chapter, the three modes purport, I think verse 16 or 17, he says that previously the mode of goodness was considered as the sign of advancement. Yeah. Whereas today, the mode of passion is considered as a sign of advancement. Mm. So I think that is a, it is not just a change in uh, change, you could say change in demographics because in one sense, the number of brahmanas are always going to be in minority. But at least what is the aspirational value? What is considered mm. to be of value? That was relatively speaking in the mode of goodness. Now, if we consider even say America's founding fathers or many of the independence uh, freedom fighters in India, they mm. were people who had a substantial level of character and they lived their lives significantly in what, not entirely, but significantly in what we could call as the mode of goodness. But it's difficult yeah. to say that about most leaders in today's world. And not just leaders, but even most, uh, you could say, cultural influencers in any way. Yeah. That's how it is. So, so, so then from mode of goodness it, to mode of passion to yeah. mode of ignorance. Yes. It goes. That's uh, in the Bhagavad Gita. It, it also... Uh, how does the verse go? And that's in 14th chapter. Uh, Rajas tamas chabibuya sattvam bhavati bharata. Rajas sattvam tamas chaiva tamas sattvam rajas tata. Uh, they're always churning like this. And they seem to be going at different speeds uh, on different levels. Um, one can think of uh, the... Um, the air atmosphere, you can often see that different levels of cloud formations are moving at different speeds. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. So it is said, and I learned this recently, that uh, the different um, the different kalpas will be predominated by different modes of nature. And therefore, uh, the, the different Puranas, because J Srila Jiva Goswami is explaining in his Tattva Sandarbha why he sort of excludes, um, why he's going to focus entirely on the Srimad Bhagavatam, because uh, the other Puranas are dealing with or are predominating or are associated with the different modes of nature, whereas this, the Bhagavatam is, uh, is Shuddha Sattva, it's beyond. So it has to do, uh, the different Puranas are associated then with different Kalpas. Oh, okay. But the, the general point I was making was that the the modes of nature are constantly shifting one into the other and so mode of goodness to mode of passion to mode of ignorance 
and out of mode of ignorance may come mode of goodness. How out of ignorance? I think in a cyclic sense, eventually too much cyclical sense. Yeah. Okay. So the end of Kali Yuga, we can say, is dominated by mode of ignorance, and then Kalki comes, and then Sattva Guna with <clears throat> the age of uh, with Satya Yuga. Hmm. Now you maybe I can bring up another subject though, unless you want to pursue that more. But I'm thinking about you brought up the point about uh, there being lots of destruction associated with the uh, avatars, right? Hmm. Um, and we see this with Kalki. We see it in. Uh, we see it with. Um, Parashurama in large numbers and then with others we see more focused Nrsingadev mm. he kills a few soldiers uh, but uh, it's it's mainly Hiranyakashipu and so on I think with Matsya there is no killing at all it's just destruction in terms of like property destruction you could say yeah there's property destruction <laughs> 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 yes. So uh, I was thinking about actually. Vamana, I was sorry, reading... sorry. I, if just to interrupt. Vamana, there is uh, no destruction at all, isn't it? In one sense. Um, Vamana is simply stretching out his feet, yeah. isn't he? Yeah. yeah. The, the, the Bali Maharaj doesn't put a resistance when his associates try to put a resistance. Uh, they have quickly beaten back, and then Balimaya themselves uh, asked him to himself asked them to step down. So uh, there's yes. no, in that sense, bloodshed over there. Yes, but Bali's, um, we could say his pride is subdued. Oh, okay, beautiful. <laughs> That's something like Lord Chaitanya. You know, he doesn't kill miscreants; he kills the miscreant desires in the heart. Right. Hmm. So, but. What I was thinking about, and I also read an interesting article on this, that in the Mahabharata, how does how does the Mahabharata begin? It begins with, excuse me, a the, sharpa satta, a sacrifice of the snakes. Mm. So it's a kind of annihilation program that goes on. Um, it's like a cosmic mm, uh, vacuum cleaner. Cosmic uh, vacuum cleaner, okay. Caused, caused by mantra of the Brahmins who call, call these snakes together and burn them up in the fire. Uh, and of course... Uh, the whole thing is stopped eventually by Asti, by this Brahman. What was its name? Astika, I think. Yeah. Uh, who manages to bring it to a stop. But the point is, it's, um, it's a kind of genocide. It's a snake genocide that goes on. Hmm. And if we're uh, thinking in terms of environmental protection uh, this uh, story this narrative then may lead us to think about another uh, case of environmental destruction in the Mahabharata namely uh, the burning of the uh, Kandava forest yeah that is quite a a graphic description of destruction. Indeed. And uh, it's been something that many ha have uh, discussed because it seems so strange. What is going on there? Um, you know, Agni says, I'm hungry. <laughs> right? And Arjuna and Krishna uh, say, 
Okay, well, we're going to make sure that Indra does not prevent you from having your meal, which is the Kandava forest. And so, uh, how does it go? In, uh, sorry, Arjuna and Krishna, with their bows and arrows, prevent Indra from stopping the fire. And not only that, not only that, and this is the shocking part, they prevent any of the animals in the forest from escaping the forest. Hmm. That's, uh, you know, that was quite disturbing to read at one level. Uh, till now, of course, I don't know how well we can explain this, but it does seem that that uh, the that forest was like the domain of evil beings or demoniac beings who had descended or in their case ascended to the earth mm. uh, um, in the garb of humans or in the garb of animals. Uh, okay. That's, it sounds like a good explanation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a, uh, I thought of this in two, three different ways because now I'm currently working on a book on the Mahabharat, more like a application kind of book, Mahabharat, yeah. for lady, uh, Mahabharat wisdom for daily life or life lessons from the Mahabharat, something like that. Mm -hmm. So one of the things here is that uh, there is there is this narrative in the Bhagavatam also of uh, the Prachetas destroying trees. Ah. But then yes. it is that it is also said that the uh, prachetas, that the trees had, they had overgrown. They had their own jurisdiction. They had extended, they had gone beyond the jurisdiction and they had preventing irrigation and preventing human habitation also. Right. So now in beating them back, there was some excess. And then there was cosmic intervention to stop, stop the prachetas also. But it yeah. seems that uh, this idea we have in the issue of the quota, so what exactly is the quota for whom that may be a matter of negotiation because in the same Mahabharat there is a description in the Vanaparva that when the Pandavas are living at one place for a long time for several years the Asdev comes to them and tells them that no, better you should move from here because if you stay here for too long then that will disrupt the, the ecology of this place. That's interesting. Yeah. I bet it didn't use the word ecology. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you know, after I used the word, I thought of, I was thinking, what word did I read in the Mahabharat? I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I think what he says over there is that, because at that time, Kshatriyas would also hunt. So maybe yes. if you hunt, the animal population will decrease here or something like that. It yeah, not I think that was the concern. That you're going to kill off all the deer and then there's going to be another problem. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. The idea of um, apportionment uh, of, uh, what was the word you used? Quota. Uh, getting the quota, yeah, getting the right balance. And this, of course, is the ongoing struggle of, uh, well, we could say conditioned life and the sense of scare scarcity, isn't it? Mm. The spiritual world, there's no scarcity. But we may say there's no scarcity because uh, nobody takes more than what they need. Yes. I, I Sometimes I wonder that in in recognizing the need to protect the environment and in recognizing that we humans have disrupted the environment, we sometimes may start looking at the environment with uh, rose tinted eyes because it's not that nature in its pristine state is always benevolent. It is both benevolent and not, I may not, we don't, we don't want to word to use malevolent because say when lions and tigers and snakes kill, they don't have any evil that they're just biologically functioning according to their bodily drives. But the fact yeah. is, 
at one level when we humans were progress uh, attempting to progress you know it was not that there were some evil people who actually wanted to disrupt the environment in one sense we were also trying to just find better ways to survive amid all the disruptions that come through the environment so maybe if we consider the environment is a part of the material world so there will be good and there will be bad both in it so uh, like for those devotees who actually go and start living in a rural place if we completely cut ourselves from off from uh, all modern technologies it's not that easy to live and it's not just no. because we are conditioned to technology it's <laughs> intrinsically there are difficulties yeah and there so, will be so many <clears throat> yeah indeed uh on the other side it's uh, been written by one scholar at Massachusetts Institute of Technology he says uh the time of their being uh wildlife in the sense of wild wild areas he says it it's no longer the case there is no more wild on this planet uh why is, because okay. because of how humans have affected everything that's anyway we're getting into a whole another subject but i wanted to continue with mahabharata um we have this kind of mass destruction in the beginning and then we have another the main mass destruction is the battle of kurukshetra uh which is said to kill how many millions hundreds of millions of people and mm. uh and before the battle what happens uh in uh, krishna's and arjuna's dialogue bhagavad gita chapter 11 Arjuna asks Krishna to show his universal form and what does he do he shows basically shows the whole battlefield being swallowed up and it seems like more than just the battlefield he's uh he's kind of consuming the world and then of course Krishna, uh, Arjuna asks him so who are you actually <laughs> and he says kalos me lokakshaya krit pravidha loka samahartami ha pravidha uh i am i am time and i'm come to destroy everything uh and then there's a third major destruction in the mahabharata at the end and that is the destruction of dwaraka uh dwaraka becomes overwhelmed by what today we would call a tsunami. Hmm. There's this uh absolute destruction overflooding permanent destruction of Dwaraka um prior to which everyone most everyone ran away they escaped and before that of course as i said before Krishna arranged on um, the destruction of the kshatriyas but the point the point so, was is was it before or after i mean it doesn't matter really but i thought that uh, all of them were destroyed and then arjuna barely got the wives of krishna out and then other ladies out and then they arjuna looks back and sees that dwarka is being uh, taken by the ocean yeah yeah like that but i'm saying the the at prabhasa kshetra that destruction goes it must be before no where the kshatriyas fight with each other in a drunken brawl yeah anyway yes, as you right. said it doesn't matter the point is there's uh the the mahabharata is very much about major destructions and I think a a question for me comes as you said associating avatars with destruction and avatars are avatars of Vishnu and Vishnu is uh the lord of maintenance so it seems that for there to be for there to be maintenance there has to be destruction 
there's creation, there's maintenance and destruction. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the final destruction, right? There's four kinds of pralaya that's mentioned in the 12th canto. There's a chapter on that. Uh, that uh, there's naimitika, uh, pralaya, there's uh, prakritika, pralaya, there's nitya pralaya, and there's atyantika pralaya. And it seems that, yeah, it's the way the material world works. There needs to be destruction for there to be in a sense, made space uh, for more creation and therefore maintenance, and therefore for facility for the Lord uh, as avatars to appear. Because otherwise we wouldn't have any reason for the Lord to appear. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't have any reason to appear. <laughs> and therefore we wouldn't, as Queen Kunti says, we wouldn't have anything to talk about. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because the main thing to talk about is Krishna's, uh, Krishna's appearances, Krishna's leela. In, uh, in one sense, uh, in modern psychology, they often talk about the chaos and order. And constantly there is this, uh, or too much order can be a problem because it constricts, but too much chaos can also be a problem. So, in one sense, we can say that this when Krishna says dharma samsthapanartha, it comes back to establish dharma. So, he is that requires a destruction of the forces that are causing our dharma. Otherwise, uh, sometimes some forces can just be regulated, but if some things can't be regulated, then uh, destruction is the only way. So, yeah, there's, there's that you can say a very purposeful destruction. Um, mm. But then nitya pralaya means uh, the, the, the constant, you can say, self-destruction of nature. That, That's nicely put, uh, yeah. You know, our bodies are disintegrating as we speak. Um, our cells are dying. Uh, the the buildings that we are sitting inside of are mm, are becoming um, destroyed gradually. They're disintegrating gradually, and we don't see it, but it's happening. So that that destruction is also there. Oh, true. Well, just in this context, uh, can we just go into the four pralayas that we mentioned? So, Atyantik mm. is the ultimate, where the soul becomes yes. liberated from worldly existence. Mm. Nitya is the constant. Then, uh, so when the Lord comes and destroys, would that fall in the Naimitti category? H how would you place Naimitti and uh, Prakritik in, in this uh, framework of analysis? Um, my understanding is from that, which chapter is it? Um, <laughs> in 12th Canto that um, the naimittika and prakritika are simply the uh, routine destructions that go on at the time of the naimittika is when Brahma goes to sleep and the prakritika is when Lord Brahma's life comes to an end. So okay. these are these are cosmic cycles. We could say they're like the seasons. And from that perspective, we can say also the cycles of uh, the yugas are are just that. They are sort of natural rotations of uh, cyclical time, which are involving destruction and also creation. And then uh, Atyantika, well, again, Nitya is, is a, just a natural um, mm. falling up. 
it's it's what's the word uh, entropy, I guess. Yeah, physicists would, entropy, yeah. would refer to entropy. That nitya pralaya is essentially it's the way material energy works. <laughs> mm. So, in one sense, when the Lord comes early, in one of our earlier podcasts, you had used the word the divine disruptor. So, mm. when the Lord causes some destruction, that's not a part of the natural cycles. It's you could say supernatural or trans, trans transcendental. Uh, so, and then if humans cause some destruction, probably that is from our perspective, it may be huge, but from the perspective of the broader history of the universe, maybe it's not that bad. Yeah, I've been wondering about that uh, just the last um, couple of weeks. We say not that bad. And Specifically, I'm wondering, <coughs> excuse me, about this <coughs> in the context of um, what is called uh, species disti- uh, extinction. Extinction, yeah. And I, I mentioned this because um, just a few days ago, I've been asked by a couple of scholars to write an article for a book they're publishing on the subject of species extinction. And they mention in their uh, invitation that uh, it's calculated now that species are disappearing at the rate of approximately one every 30 minutes Really? And shocking. And yeah, and that uh, we are already down 70% of whatever the number of species has been, I don't, I don't know, 200 years ago or whatever. So down, now, down 70% means, then means only 30% is remaining or 30% yes. has gone down? No, 30% oh. is remaining. That's what I understand. Okay. So, you know, we like to say, oh, well, um, there are and always have been and always will be 8,400,000 species. And if a species uh, disappears from this planet, we can be sure they are somewhere else. So the dinosaurs are, you know, uh, marching around somewhere else. We don't know where. Um, So, okay, that's, let us, who who are we to say that that's not the case, right? Um, We take it from Shastra and so on. Although I don't think Shastra explicitly says you'll find all these species somewhere else. Uh, but I, but my point is that um, you were saying maybe it's not so bad from a from a higher perspective, from a cosmic perspective, and yet mm, it seems like it is really bad. <laughs> What's happening? We're destroying on this planet, even if we say they're going to some other planet. But what are we doing? Sorry to get us back to environmental concerns, but I'm thinking about this a lot now. What are we actually doing and what are we doing to stop ourselves from uh, the destruction we're doing? That's true. And maybe this raises a question, you know, do we need an environment avatar to come and stop us? (laughs) That's a beautiful thought. Environmental avatar, yeah. So then I just, I I appreciate this point that the extent of destruction has been, uh, is is shocking. And uh, the more I read the statistics, the more alarming it becomes. Uh, When I said it's not significant, or it may not be that big, I only meant it in the sense that if we consider in the big picture of the kind of destruction that nature itself can bring about in its own course, what we humans can do does seem to 
seem to be not that much like what one storm can do of course we can say that what one storm can do uh we humans can also do by by our weapons of mass destruction and just adding to your point you know the last century uh, was the most destructive century in at least uh, recorded human history as per modern historical records according to that yeah. world watch institute they said something like the number of people killed in wars and murders in the last century is actually seven times more than the number of people killed in the previous 19th centuries combined together yeah mm-hmm. and that's primarily because of because of not I'm not blaming technology for it but but it because we had the technological tools to destroy each other so the destruction was far more and of course there were ideological motivations and brainwashing of people yes and prophet says speaking of the technological side of that prophet says uh said once um when when they have the weapons they will use them sooner or later if we have the atomic bomb we will use it eventually yes and that's uh, you know in one sense now the the theory of whether this covid started because of a lab leak that theory is now earlier it was dismissed as conspiracy theory but now it is gaining at least uh if not uh acceptability but at least it's been considered mm. so that also indicates that if we develop some research or if we we develop something destructive it will get used if not intentionally sometimes it may get used unintentionally also and so yeah. you know regarding going back to ecology i was yeah. i just read this you talking about species get disappearing it seems right now there is like a mice epidemic in australia and it seems mice are overrunning everywhere acha and yeah. it's like people in peace at people's homes inside on their farms and everywhere in many parts yeah. of australia and yeah. one reason they are saying is that they somehow because of some reason they eliminated a lot of cats from the outdoors now of course oh. it's, <laughs> it's like uh, some it might be a simplistic explanation but that's certainly one part of the explanation being given yeah so sometimes the elimination of some species elimination of species may may not seem to be consequential for us but sometimes it can turn out to be consequential in a catastrophic way yeah yeah that's i mean that's seen again and again that uh you you cannot anticipate what the consequence is going to going to be of a particular manipulation of uh of the mm. environment yeah so my just going back to your point of uh, what you are saying that the power of human agency mm-hmm. in uh so we you know the three these three factors are there there is this uh, we call it as jeeva prakriti and bhagwan ishwara the soul mm. nature and uh, and the divine mm. uh, so now if you consider nature these four types of pralaya basically refer to what is wrought by nature itself right and then beyond that so we humans can cause some destruction and when the lord comes he can also orchestrate some destruction yeah so if we humans like the going back to that point you said in one sense the gadgets are like extensions of our senses so so if people could fight with fists but now they can fight with machine guns or missiles or whatever else so then the jeeva's destructive capacity is also increased substantially because of technological power because we can do constructive work also but the point i was making is that uh, that this whole idea of technological progress and uh, the whole idea of regress that is described in the bhagavatam so for example bhagavatam says people's heights will decrease and mm-hmm. things like that now kalki said will come with a sword now of course we could say that uh, maybe his sword is like a high tech sword with uh, <laughs> it has it has some celestial powers laser a laser sword <laughs> yeah so in the past they were using a 
weapons like bows and arrows but the arrows seem to have far greater power and even precision than some of our missiles like yes ashwatthama could target uttara's womb without without hurting uttara yeah specifically so so, so but my point the point i was making through all this is the predictions that are given in the bhagavatam in principle we can see them true seem manifesting in terms of things getting worse but in specific we don't see some of them manifesting till now things seem to go in opposite direction and in, like i said technology seems to advancing hardly anyone will fight with swords now but on the other side we some of the things that are described over there we seem to have far exceeded that like people's uh, what you read over there people's attachment will be only to their families and don't exist mm. people's concern will not extend beyond beyond the families well, in today's world if somebody actually takes care of the family that itself is laudable people are not yes. people are not able to do even that <clears throat> so so these predictions how do we see all of them like we seem to have overshot some of them and we seem to be going in opposite direction from some of them <laughs> it's overshot <laughs> <laughs> we're laughing but we should be crying uh yeah. how to see indeed yeah we are we are urged to see through the uh with shastra chakshu isn't it uh mm. to see things through the perspective of of shastra and then things happen which don't seem to fit one way or another with shastra so you mentioned before um th- these three principles ishvara prakriti uh ishvara prakriti and jiva jiva's karma we can say and then you related that to uh to destruction and it occurred to me now human destruction has reached a point where um because now they talk about the anthropocene uh geological time is you know measured in very long periods of time but now they're speaking of the anthropocene as like a a layer over the planet earth of how humans are affecting the world on the level of nature in ways uh that have never been there before and so uh we reach a point where human destruction is causing prakritiki uh, prakriti or nitya destruction at a rate uh never before seen sorry so can you repeat how could how could human uh, factors well collectively prakritiki... collectively the human species this is the idea of what they're calling the anthropocene which is it's becoming more and more accepted it, it was a recent idea um okay. but now there it seems even ge- geologists are accepting yeah this is you could call this the anthropocene and someone has even marked as a as a year when it started namely 1950 uh which is the year i was born <laughs> um oh, okay uh why was it because of uh the appearance of certain chemicals as a result of human activity anyway so the point is that collectively human beings are now affecting nature to such an extent okay that um and, and the fear is that it's going to become irreversible that's why they're saying if we increase uh the atmospheric temperature beyond 1.5 degrees centigrade that's it there's no return there's no going back it's going to then there's a term for it but it's going to be self perpetuating more and more destructive more more and more disturbed um uh, and of course nature eventually is going to balance itself out with or without humans <laughs> on this planet mm, that's true 
<clears throat> Maybe we should look a little. I have before me now uh, chapter two of Canto 12, uh, The Symptoms of Kali Yuga. So it may be interesting to look at some of these. Yes. In the very beginning, it says, uh, Shishuka Uvacha <coughs> Tatas Chanudinam Dharma Satyam Shocham Shamadaya Kalena Balina Rajan Nankshatyayur Balang Smriti. Then, O King, religion, truthfulness, cleanliness, tolerance, mercy, duration of life, physical strength, and memory will all diminish day by day, day, by day because of the powerful influence yes. of the age of Kali. Um, yeah, religion, truthfulness, cleanliness, tolerance, mercy. Uh, these include, of course, the pillars of religion as we understand them, which are maintained by the observance of uh, regulative principles. Uh, much of generally is, is just ignored and not understood. Um, even in India today, where we understand the, uh, the principle of daya, of mercifulness, is maintained uh, by uh, keeping, uh, by avoiding meat eating, for example. Now the estimate is that the percentage of people in India uh, keeping a diet, a vegetarian or vegan diet, has gone down has gone down to 18%. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. That's still the highest in the world, as far as I know. Um, but, um, you know, what would it have been maybe 100 years ago? Uh, we don't know because we don't have statistics from, from then, but very possibly twice that or maybe more but it's down to 18% in India. Uh, verse 2 says, Vittam eva kalo nrinang janmachara gunadaya dharma nyaya vyavastayam karanam balam eva hi. In Kali Yuga, wealth alone will be considered the sign of a man's good birth, proper behavior, and fine qualities. And law and justice will be applied only on the basis of one's power. Hmm. So some of Dump these really see, see happening. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Dampatye abiruchir hetur Mayaiva vyavaharike streetve pungstve chahi ratir vipratve sutram evahi. Men and women will live together merely because of superficial attraction, and success in business will depend on deceit. Uh, womanliness and manliness will be judged according to one's expertise in sex, and a man will be known as a brahmana just by his wearing a thread. <laughs> it's interesting the way the translation is done. Mm. It is not, they will live together merely. They're not even saying they, they'll marry based on superficial attractions. Yeah. Mm. Dampati technically refers to Marriage, isn't it? Uh, husband and wife. Husband and yeah. wife, yeah. But, Maya So, we do see, as you saying, would you like to go over almost all of them? Or at least some of them? Yeah, we can. Oh, then, it's up to you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, 
what i was thinking is that certainly some things we can clearly see coming out true so if we want to talk about kalki in one sense there's not much information about kalki himself so right because we, he hasn't appeared yet <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> yeah but of course i think the way we discuss about buddha also you know we didn't go more into the uh, in one sense we could say in last time we had that discussion of comparative so it was more of we didn't focus on buddha as the consequence of the appearance of buddha in today's world so similarly this with kalki kalki it seems we are discussing more the setting that will lead to the appearance of kalki hmm. because the bhagavatam yes. also focuses on that more yes. and then this is the problem that kalki will solve so i think most of the predictions are that way quite clear but uh, it it does raise another question though yeah i think and that is um because we understand kalki comes at the end of the age of kali and the general principle of the avatars is that they come when there's some disturbance and there's a need for reestablishing religion and we may someone may uh, um it begs the question why why don't we have more avatars coming more frequently hmm why do we have to wait 400 and something thousand years <laughs> for an avatar to come and this uh, leads me to mention it's been a some time since i read so i'm not uh completely sure which uh of the kachvaha kings but i'm thinking it's jai singh sawai jai singh the second identified himself as kalki avatar oh it seems that it seems to be like almost a past time of many so called religious leaders to identify themselves as kalki or oh. at least it is their followers activity and with many uh-huh. of the many of the indian spiritual leaders who are who are who are claimed to be god or whose followers claim to be god uh-huh. they often have stories about how you know they were born in so and so village and actually in the past this village was known as sambhala and Achha. their parents had this name but then you know the, the father also had this name and this is referring to they do a lot of and actually things. my father's name was vishu yesha <laughs> 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 yeah and suddenly there's lots of vishnu yashas everywhere <laughs> <laughs> true hmm. so but, but my also, but yeah. my question is um why so infrequent the avatars and on the other side it is said that the the number of avatars are uh are countless yeah that's a well one you could say a convenient answer is that krishna is always with us as the holy name in kaliyuga but uh, it, it really doesn't exactly address the question what you're saying kali kale nama rupe krishna avatar that is there is always with us but what are your thoughts about it mm-hmm. Well one thought is that one of the categories of avatar uh is shakti avesha and in fact i just read it it's in lagu bhagavatamrita that kalki avatar is an um uh, an a shakti avesha avatar but one point about shakti avesha the concept the category it really opens it opens a wide open as far as i see the possibilities um anyone who shows some special power may be considered shakti avesha and that's why i think 
we like to say that Srila Prabhupada is Shakti Avesha. We all feel he is indeed um, especially empowered. That's interesting. So in one sense, uh, at least in the human imagination, human cultural imagination, the role of human agency has become far more in modern times than in previous ages. I think that started happening from the time of Renaissance, where it was that we are not just meant to, the world is not just a place where you cross through to get to a better life in the next world, but the world is a place to be explored, to be, uh, to be learned from, to be enriched, uh, to, to be depicted through art, to be de developed through technology. So if human agency in general is given much more importance in Kali Yuga, then it also stands to reason that, uh, that human agency would be also used for spiritual purposes more. So, oh, this sounds very hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> so that means we can have more Shakti Avesha avatars coming. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> and I just thought of it the first time, but because we were discussing earlier, but it also is true that, uh, that uh, Dharma was maintained throughout history, not just by the periodic appearance of the Lord, but there was also order to society and that order was maintained by human agents, isn't it? So, of course, now we, whether they are all to be called Shakti Shautars, because the list mm. of Shakti Shautars seems to be more indicative than conclusive, than like exhaustive. Mm. Right. So, in some ways, uh, in the Vedic tradition, this boundary between human and divine, it is a little porous. It's very porous. Not just very a little porous. I would say it's very porous. Oh, really? <laughs> and in that way, it's quite the opposite uh, of the um, Abrahamic traditions. Because in the Abrahamic traditions, there's a, you can say, a complete um, absence of any intermediate position. Well, that's also not true. They they have angels and so on, but they're all kind of invisible beings. But basically you have God and you have humans, and then you have all the different animals. And therefore the idea in Christianity, which draws from the Jewish tradition, which was anticipating a Messiah, right? The Messiah, the Savior, was going to be a political figure in the Jewish tradition who was going to come and set everything right uh, in, their, in their world uh, because they were constantly persecuted. So then when uh, Jesus came along and he was identified by his followers as the Messiah, it kind of stuck. But that was also, as I understand, maybe it's oversimplifying, that's why he was uh, crucified, he was killed, because the Jews said, no, 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 he's not the Messiah. He's, you know, the Messiah we're expecting is gonna be carrying a sword and, um, He's going to be riding on a on a horse. I mean, I think they were anticipating Kalki, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Okay. So then, okay. so then, you know, Christianity, and then uh, the theology developed in Christianity that he is the Messiah, and he is the one and only incarnation. So in and therefore, he's the one and only via media between God and humans. That was the idea. 
Hmm. Which is, I think, you know, completely yeah. diff opposite from uh, the Indian understanding, Indian, let's call it uh, the Sanatan Dharma understanding that there's, um, there's uh, between human and divine is, is a whole spectrum of possibility. Hmm. So just, uh, I think Islam took this a little further and then they say that associating anything with, uh, with Allah is shark. And then that leads to a, that is considered to be blasphemy of the highest order. Right. So, so, the, so the porosity of the human divine, while it, on one side it can lead to confusion about who is, about the ontological status of a particular spiritual leader, but it also actually makes the divine much more accessible. Yeah. Isn't it? So, yes, it makes a sense, it gives the sense that uh, the Lord is, is very much involved in the world, that he, um, he gives, for some time, he gives uh, one or another or several of his opulences to empower someone to do something uh, important for, for balancing dharma. And, and so it facilitates uh, a sense of the, um, yeah, accessibil accessibility and therefore the reality of God. How is accessibility related with reality? The more we access, the more we get faith that he's real? Yeah, the more, the more accessible the Lord is, the easier it is to, easier it is to um, acknowledge his existence. Hmm. The Lord is Bhagavan, uh, so Aishvaryasya Samagrasya Viryasya Yashasashriya all the opulences, when they manifest in extraordinary, to an extraordinary degree, mm. um, then we can appreciate. And, however, that can be misused. And therefore, Prabhupada spoke so strongly, you know, about the Bhagavan on every street corner. Everybody's claiming to be Bhagavan. Yeah, Bhagwan on every street corner. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, <laughs> oh, that's true. It is a, it is a provocatively graphic image of how <laughs> well, how easy it has become for people to claim that they or their their leader is God. And now, just backtracking a little bit, so this. You are talking about the King uh, Man Singh, Sabai Man Singh claiming to be Kalki. Sabai Jai Singh. Sabai Jai Singh. So uh, claiming to be Kalki. Was that, you were, were you going to make some specific point by that or you're just giving example of how that long before Kali Yuga has ended, people are claiming to be Kalki who has come? Yeah, we're, we're generally understanding Kalki is... Um, hasn't come and he won't come for a very long time. And I just find it intriguing uh, that here we have a king from the 18th century uh, um, saying, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> and this ties in uh, from what I read with his, he did have a concern for Dharma and that concern we are familiar with to the extent that he was calling these assemblies where um, Srila Baladevid Yabhushana came uh, to defend uh, the position of the Gaudiya Vaishnavas against mm -hmm. uh, the position of other Vaishnavas who were um, criticizing the Gaudiya Vaishnavas for, for their uh, practices and their presence and so on. Um, all of this was facilitated by the king. 
he was concerned, um, and he was specifically concerned about the subject of uh, parakia versus svakia uh, bhava, because in his kingdom, there were apparently those who were misusing the idea of parakia uh, understanding, parakia bhava, in ways which, you know, were uh, promoting adharma. And so with that concern, or the, as part of his concern, he was apparently identifying himself with Kalki, the avatar who comes to uh, correct and to reestablish dharma. So I don't know if that means he was also claiming we are now at the end of the age of Kali. I don't know if he was saying now we're going to usher in the age of uh, the uh, Satya or Krita Yuga, I don't know. So it's interesting the way you're putting it that it was not a, you could say a concealed power grab that by claiming to be God Kalki, it was not exactly that he was trying, maybe that was a part of his motive, we don't know but there was also a concern for Dharma. Hmm. So it's it's uh, so even the claim of a particular leader to be div- to be an incarnation of the divinity, that that uh, could be out of good intentions also. Yeah, it could be a pious motivation. <laughs> True. Mm, so now, when we say Kalki comes, Kalki is described as the tenth avatar. Uh, then. Uh, we discussed earlier that this, this list of 10 is not necessarily a exhaustive list. But do we have something like, uh, are all these 10 avatars in uh, one, one Divya Yuga, you can say, or one, one cycle of any kind? Does, now, of course, we know Krishna appears only once. And ba- even if we say Balram, Balram is unlikely to appear without Krishna. Uh, I just read that I think it's in Lagu Bhagavatamrita that um, it gives a list of eight out of the 10 avatars as appearing within our Vaivasvata Manu period. Okay. So I- there are 14 Manus in one day of Brahma and there are 1,000 yuga cycles. Is that right? I always mix these things up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which suggests that uh, it's not so often that these main avatars, if we call them main avatars, are appearing. Okay, so this doesn't necessarily, the 10 doesn't ref- ref- refer to any cycle from Satya to uh, satya to Kali or like within one day of Brahma or something like that necessarily. It seems not, no. Okay. So is there any a common thread that is there within these avatars that, uh, that Jaya Goswami seems to have selected these 10? We don't have any insight. Of course, it, it's not only Jaya Goswami. The other source also the Shavataras. But why this 10 list? Is there any particular uh, <laughs> uh, particular pattern think, or particular rationale that you are aware of? Well, perhaps we can take a hint from uh, Jayadev Goswami's 11th verse, uh, which uh, goes, Shri Jayadeva Kaveri Ramuri Tamudaram. Shinu Sukadam Shubadam Babasaram Keshavadrita Dasha Rupa Jaya Jagadisha Hare. And the translation is O Keshava, O Lord of the universe, O Lord Hari, who have assumed these ten different forms of incarnation, all glories to you. Um, o readers, please hear this hymn. 
of the poet Jayadev, which is most excellent, an awarder of happiness, a bestower of auspiciousness, and is the best thing in this dark world. Best thing in this dark world. Okay. Yes, bhava saram. Um, bhava means material world. Saram means essence. Uh, so he seems to feel that uh, these ten are a kind of essence of the avatars. Hmm. So at least more than that, of- I would not be able to say. But yeah. I think it's also interesting that where does this uh, song, this Dash Avatar Stotra appear? It appears in the beginning as a kind of introduction to his Gita Govinda. And as we know, the Gita Govinda is uh, describing Radha Krishna Leela, very intimate Leela. And um, I think we can say safely enough that it's a quite different mood (laughs) <laughs> from this Das Avatara Stotra. Yes. But we may want to say also that the Das Avatara Stotra is setting the scene in the sense that these 10 avatars are establishing Dharma and reestablishing Dharma. And on the platform, the foundation of Dharma is where he is now uh, singing his Gita Govinda. So that if someone is saying, oh, this uh, Gita Govinda is adharmic, because some may say that, because it does uh, deal, it, it's, it's kind of, um, it, much of it sounds quite worldly, it's been said. Uh, and at the same time, we understand it's fully spiritual because it's Radha and Krishna. It's the, it's the eternal dalliance of Radha and Krishna is fully spiritual. So he's saying, this is Dharma. Don't think it's not Dharma. I would see it that way. And how do we know it's Dharma? Because uh, we, first of all, offer our respects to all of the avatars of the Lord, these 10 avatars who establish what is Dharma. Why would one do that uh, if one were now going to go on and um, and write a poem that's about a dharma, that wouldn't make sense. Oh, okay. So in one sense, in the Rasa Panchadhyay, the description that this is not mundane, in one sense, comes at the end. Where he says, those mm. who hear about this, their lusty desires will decrease and mm. love for them will increase. So that clearly indicates that this is not about lust. Otherwise, how those desires mm. decrease? So in contrast with that, Jaydev Goswami here puts, puts that in the beginning. Yeah, we can say like that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe not in contrast. Does he have something at the end also? I don't remember. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> but, uh, so you could say that here through all these avatars, which demonstrate the Lord's power and greatness, through that, and they all come to establish, to establish dharma. Then, when we talk about this sweetness of the Lord, that also is so yes. he's, he's setting up the scene for the first describing this, for describing the sweetness by first depicting the greatness of that Lord also. Yeah. So then, from his perspective, Krishna cannot be one of the Dashavatars. because it is about Krishna who has come as all these. And and Krishna is all about Madhurya, not Aishvarya. Yes. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, just uh, I, we, I don't think we discussed this when we discussed Balram. So, if all the avatars are about um, Aishwarya, is Balram a little bit more about Aishwarya than Krishna? Um. <laughs> well, if we think of um, yeah, if we think of Balaram's uh, pastimes as a whole, um, and his. His, uh, his tattva in relation to Krishna, we can say he's much more about opulence. He's creating all the facility for Krishna to have his pastimes. Oh, that's beautiful, yeah. And that's one of his eternal functions also. Yeah. That he is yes. providing. 
so he is using his opulence to for krishna to manifest his sweet pastimes exactly okay beautiful <laughs> and on that sweet note um perhaps you can do your famous overview of what we've discussed yes ma'am i'll try so today we discussed about kalki avatar and we started by first the prayer so then i mentioned from the, that is this indiscriminate killing so you quoted from the bhagavatam that it's actually killing of the millions of kings people or people who were dressed as kings and who were tyrants or who were abusers of power and then the citizens after that they were relieved and so it is not it is later on used for purposeful destruction not indiscriminate so mm-hmm. then in that connection i think a, a significant part of our discussion was about about deterioration destruction so you read several prophecies about kali yuga and then so we talked about how while the bhagavatam says that the moral arc is going down modern society consider that the art that actually society is progressing so so this idea of progress is it from the 18th 19th century is roughly the steam engine onwards it started catching the cultural imagination mm-hmm. of people and then mm-hmm. while we were progressing we didn't realize that it was not going to lead to moral progress and we didn't at all realize that it's going to lead to ecological not just regress but it's something like a apocalypse so mm. several points or fossil fuels being used for all the devices and then that led to a discussion on how we humans are disrupting the ecology in various ways and uh, so you've talked about how maybe we need a environmental avatar of the lord also in the future <laughs> to set things in order and uh, so we discussed about the four kinds of pralaya in that context and uh, this i like the correlation between entropy and uh, nitya pralaya that it's a constant self destruction and of nature that is there so that's like the tendency within physics is, or in science that is described as the tendency of things to deteriorate of a system to move towards greater disorder so beyond what nature does there is human agency and there is divine agency so when the lord comes and he does some destruction that's that's a fun category and the we souls we humans can also do some destruction and we discussed about some destruction of envi- and or maybe broadly attitudes to the environment in the mahabharat so is the kandava destruction which could possibly be because the the animals populating there were evil beings come from lower planets and there is also the destruction of the kurukshetra war and there is the destruction of dwarka and before that you mentioned uh, there is also the sarpa yagya sarpa satta is it sarpa sarpa satta yeah yeah so that is is almost like genocide of snakes and asking us stop it so now you are giving that example it, the kurukshetra killing was required in one sense because dharma and krishna arranging the destruction in dwarka was like what is this preemptive strike we could say so that after his after his departure the, the his powerful relatives and family members wouldn't misuse that power so that led to the discussion about how we humans seem to be so vulnerable to vice and uh, evil and even in the lord's time and especially more in kaliyuga now so in kaliyuga how bad is the human agency to destroy so we might think it's it's not significant but it is huge you quoted several statistics that like one species determined this dis- disappearing every 30 minute 30 minutes at a shocking and that india is the top most most vegetarian country in the world but even there it is barely 18% or something like that people are vegetarian now and also another stats you mentioned was that now we have only 30% of the biodiversity of the species that were existing before and while that might just seem to be like a maybe a, just a fact of 
interest for people with the environment uh, but it's uh, it can be a pressing concern when one species gets imbalanced like say the mice epidemic in australia and then <laughs> <laughs> so you know the way we are harming the ecology you there's this anthropocene that we and we may have entered a geological age where the human influence on the environment has become so substantial and so severe that an age has been named for that and there's a chance that there is a possibility that if the temperature of the earth goes beyond a particular point it may be irreversible so what can we do about it that was you know if human agency can affect the universe in a bigger neg- bigger way negatively then maybe human agency can affect it positively also so the lord when he comes he just destroys in order to restore order so the destruction is that way purposeful but in kalyuga why is he not coming so often one reason could be that he is he is there as the holy name another is maybe he wants human agents to work on his behalf and prabhupad is considered as to a shakti avish avatar so that's where we talked about the difference between the porous human divine boundaries in the vedic tradition whereas the rigid in the abrahamic traditions it's interesting you said how maybe the messiah that they were predict they were hoping for was actually kalki and they so with respect to this porosity of the human divine there is greater accessibility there is greater chance to realize the real reality of the divine and then ultimately to love the divine but the danger is like prabhupad said that there can be that there is a bhagwan on every street corner <laughs> so so that but now when some people claim to be god it might not be because of nefarious intentions also like mm. devir singh he was very concerned about dharma he had all these assemblies to determine the authenticity of parke rasa and yet he was a 18th century king who claimed to be Kal, who claimed to be incarnation of kalki and then also we discuss a little bit about the uh, nature of the predictions that are described so we went through some of the predictions and they do seem to be happening so while technological progress is there but uh, if we consider technology to be like the extension of our senses then maybe we are just this technological progress is a part of kali's delusion so that all the moral regress that is happening all the spiritual degradation that is happening all the all the things other environmental degradation that is happening all the psychological uh, psychological challenges that are coming up you mentioned about anxiety and fear both of no fear and depression or anxiety and depression mm. so those are all increasing so we we also talked about how brahmanas are so important and if brahmanas had had were existing and they say for example maybe brahmanas could have thought in a more far sighted way about the consequences of certain adopting certain technologies yeah you know, we that, talked about the amish, amish. yeah amish as yeah. i was mentioning that that how it's not that they are against they don't it's not that they reject technology but they would think very deeply about how technology is likely to affect them and then they very carefully accept certain things they may have phones but outdoors they may use vehicles but they don't own vehicles they use them for traveling and they have a communitarian system where if say one barn is burnt or something like that people immediately come within you said in 24 hours it was restored much better than a modern insurance system and i think in that connection you mentioned also that maybe a participatory form of democracy could be better that we discussed because we're talking about how uh when the lord comes he comes to destroy kings who who have become abusive of power yeah. and to the out of the fear of such authoritarian or dictatorial rulers we have democracy but we don't have a mechanism to actually prevent authoritarian mentality from coming in people and to prevent that we need trained brahmanas and yeah. also if overall the world could come to a higher at least to some mode of goodness then things could improve so if people heard more satvik music people appreciated satva guna more so we may have progressed in in the sense <laughs> one sense but uh 
the definition of progress has become aligned more with passion than with goodness yes and that is that's in itself a problem but uh, so kalki is going to come in the future at the end of kaliyuga but we can say that there are some sign there are some signs of uh, the lord acting through through prabhupada and through devotees through his lord like chaitanya that. lord mm-hmm. chaitanya of course himself coming and there is this, we didn't mention this we said i think that there's the prophecy of a golden age also within kaliyuga yes that's uh, some sort of prophecy is there golden yeah. age Yeah. And of course we haven't talked about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as the avatari the, avatari. the yes. source yes. the source of all avatars not just the yuga avatar. Yeah. Um but um that's our hope I think that's our understanding isn't it? <laughs> mm, yes. <laughs> and of course towards the end we discuss about Krishna how he's talking about this greatness and about the dharma dharmic purpose of previous avatar so to as a prelude to show that jayadev go swami is showing that these are the uh, the these are, that this poem which might seem somewhat sensual or adharmic it is not to be seen like that so we mm. can relish the sweetness of the lord and in terms of so we can say that the chautar are describing aishwarya and balram is providing the aishwarya for the madhuri lila of krishna and krishna is demonstrating the madhurya so yeah yes. chaitanya mahaprabhu i was just thinking just to con- conclude this theme can we relate uh, chaitanya mahaprabhu anyway with uh, the environmental avatar that you are mentioning did chaitanya oh. mahaprabhu do anything about so he loved to Rindavan. think about he loved Rindavan. i have to think about that <laughs> yeah um, uh, i have to i don't know that might get me started on a whole another tangent <laughs> <laughs> maybe we should take it up another time <laughs> yes varaj thank you very much it's been a wonderful journey great thank you prabhu thank you grateful to you it's been a wonderful journey i i like this kind of churning uh of uh of krishna katha and so on i think it's very nice and i think devotees like too isn't it people yes, are definitely varaj listening in mm in one sense we we did a, something like a the the shautars whenever the past times are discussed in the classes it's more of a you could say a traditional devotional kind of analysis which is also important relishable but what we also did was more of a you could say a contempor- contemporary analysis if i may use that word yeah so i don't well, think that it it we we're sort of in a more relaxed way our purpose is not it's not to come to some preconceived conclusion i think uh we're just as in a sort of open open-ended way we're exploring um and for me it's all part of the spirit of what prabhupad called uh discussing the bhagavatam from all angles of vision hmm he wanted to encourage he sometimes he would say discuss the bhagavatam thread bear thread bear okay yeah and the bhagavatam is huge to discuss it thread bear yeah. would take years but at least well, he said in different. one at least in one lecture he said you can spend one month on every single verse and then he said how long will that take you <laughs> in effect he said do the math yeah. and i think he was inspired by the fact that his guru maharaj shila bhakti siddhanta thakur spent a month on verse number 111 yeah uh, at radhakund he gave lectures every day on verse 111 and prabhupada is saying actually you can do that with any verse of the bhagavatam yes man it's a beautiful thought to there's so much to churn in the we did some churning but we yeah. did the shautar in the doing... ten sessions but one verse can be churned so much thank you yes. for giving this glimpse of the nectar available through churning maharaj so now let's see if we come up with another series <laughs> yes sir surely we'll plan that out Thank you very much. Is it Thank you. Thank you. Shri Prabhupada. Shri Prabhupada ki jai. Hare Krishna.